started this study about four or five years ago, we noticed that there were certain children. Our studies, we take a small piece of diaphragm at the time of the repair. Diaphragm is literally one millimeter by one millimeter. It's not, it will not affect the repair at all. And we take a small piece of skin from the incision once before we close it off about one millimeter to one millimeter by one millimeter. And then we take blood and we take blood from the skin. And what we, and that is because we started with the issue to see if we found some sort of genetic abnormality, translocation, whatever, would we find it everywhere in the child? Or would it be something that's lo localized to the diaphragm? In other words, is this a genetic problem that's literally just in the diaphragm? Or is it everywhere? And what we found, without getting too detailed, was that a couple of the kids who had very severe seizures, didn't do well, required ECMO, and we did, had the abnormality on all three tissues, blood, skin, and diaphragm. But some of the kids who had the abnormalities that localized just in the diaphragm seemed to do better. And that was sort of the impetus, is that we think that it's not just an issue of, of a genetic abnormality, which genetic abnormality, but it also might be an issue of how prevalent that genetic abnormality is, how strong it is in the baby itself. In other words, is it localized to different tissues at different points? And if something happens in the diaphragm itself, it might be something that that could be a So that's, that's relevant to the things that we are looking at well in the newborn period, because when you do the surgery, to uh, we don't, we don't know, we won't take the child and then we operate on them. It's at the time of operation we take a little piece of diaphragm and spin to it. And then to see if those things are present or not. So that's, that's a little bit different about our study. And that was what, when Wendy and I first decided that we were going to apply for the National Institute of Health for funding, was that was sort of what triggered it. That we found that just a couple of patients, it wasn't a very widespread thing, but those couple of patients were very specific. primarily with genetics, right? Yeah. It's all genetic related. Do, I, I'm asking, are there any other signs that point to um, reasons why children might develop this besides the genes? Are you like guys just involved in that? in the environment yeah. or something like that? I think if there was something like that, it probably would have been discovered already. In other words, there's a lot of things that babies are born with that we know this is a vitamin D deficiency or this is more prevalent in lower socioeconomic yeah,
something and this group not to. And so I think it's but you, it, it's something, probably it's something striking that there was a strong association between the two groups that was described and written about for 30, 40 years. Probably something would have come up. I'll give you an example of something called gaseous heat, which is an abnormality that comes from abdominal wall support. And we know that that's associated with a lower socioeconomic status, single, single parent pregnancy for women who's under the age of 20. We don't know why that is. Maybe it's a nutrition thing. We don't know what that is, but we know that there's an association. Or um, <coughs> we know myeloma and has to do with vitamin D. So we have to odds are if there was something very striking like that, we would know it already. And we don't. Nobody, the only thing we can find is that there are some families where they have what's called consanguineous families, where there's a lot of intermarriage cousins, first cousins marrying and stuff like that. Those seem to be the only, the only group of patients that have a lot of genetically related diseases. But the average person is doing what we call a very sporadic thing, in other words. When you can do a very exhaustive history on the both parents and there's no hint, it's not more common in our, in our regimes like cystic fibrosis, it's not like case by case. It's not more common in African Americans or Asians or this or that. It doesn't seem to be doesn't seem to have any association like that. That, that, that makes it very hard. Because if we did have association, we would limit our, well, we wouldn't limit, but we would really hone in and focus our study on that group of people. We did um, somewhat of an epidemiologic study within our charity. The last time that we pulled out a report was 2000, and I think we had 300, 400 families where they gave us every detail of their pregnancy with 20 page surveys. Um, it was all voluntary, and we found nothing. We found no, no instances of any type of clusters, no certain area, no certain exposure. We asked what they did for a living, where they lived, if it was near airport, <coughs> if they lived near um, an elect electrical field or anything. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And we'll be doing that again. Um, we're actually, we've actually been working on the database for over a year. And when that goes live, and I'm not even going to give a date anymore because it's taken us forever to get this thing up, then everyone will be able to put in your entire family medical history and it will tabulate results on the fly. And we're, gonna, we're trying very, very hard to get all 3,200 families to put in your information. But so far, we haven't found any type of exposure. So hopefully one of these wonderful researchers We'll find a gene. What am I going to do about this? Can you try to check my information?